Right? Can you see that? There will be three dots. If you click on it, there will be a function there, stop annotation. And uh, those of you who are listening, uh, if uh, Sajid is unable to do that, uh, disable that function, please be aware that uh, unintentionally you might be doing it. So that disturbs everybody. So Sajid, you can carry on if you cannot find it. Don't worry. Clear all drawings and then... Uh, you know, on the bottom, there are three dots. If you hover uh, on this bottom tab, there will be three dots and uh, there will be a drop-up menu in which there will be one function stop annotation. But okay, I think right. I, I know, yeah, there we are. Uh, right. Disable annotations for others. Exactly. There we are. Okay. okay. So uh, we've got the rounded lateral meniscus and we've got the more sort of lazy curved medial meniscus. These menisci are actually made of fibrocartilage and fibrocartilage in the body is distributed in terms of the fibrocartilaginous discs, like the disc you get in symphysis pubis, in the acromioclavicular joint, at the annular margins of the discs, annulus fibrosis, and the biggest fibrocartilage is, of course, the menisci of the knee joint. You've got the acetabular labrum and you've got the glenoid labrum. They're all examples of fibrocartilage. All these fibrocartilage structures are uh, low signal intensity on MR and they appear echogenic on ultrasound. So if you try and evaluate the meniscus with ultrasound, you can see parts of it. Uh, you will notice that the medial and the lateral menisci are slightly echogenic. Similarly, the glenoid labrum, when you see that on ultrasound, is a bit echogenic. But all these structures on, on MR assessment are of low signal intensity. They work as um, big swabs which uh, distribute the synovial fluid within the knee joint, and they also provide some degree of cushioning to the tibiofemoral articular surfaces. Uh, this particular uh, drawing is really important because it allows you to remember uh, the arrangement of structures on the uh, upper tibial eminence. So this uh, drawing has been made as if you are looking uh, from top down into the knee joint. The femur has been removed. That's the front. That's the back. That's the lateral side. So it's a right knee and that's the medial side. And we see that on the central tibial eminence, you've got the anterior horn of the medial meniscus as the most anterior structure. Then you've got the tibial attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament. Then you've got the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Then you've got the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Then you've got the uh, posterior horn of the medial meniscus and most posterior you've got the tibial attachment of the posterior cruciate ligament so m a m a a l p mol m p medial meniscus anterior horn anterior cruciate ligament tibial attachment anterior horn of lateral posterior horn of lateral posterior horn of medial and posterior cruciate ligament that's one mnemonic, which is quite useful to remember the arrangement of structures on the upper tibia. Now I've lost my ability to move the mouse. I can see your mouse uh, moving. I can see my mouse. I can't move to the next slide. So that's what I did. Uh, 
So uh, maybe you can try to exit the PowerPoint and come back in. Stop sharing. Stop share and come out of it. Yes. So um, that's the important mnemonic that we um, all should remember. The meniscus, as we've seen, it is a semi-lunar shaped structure. And in the sagittal imaging, it gives uh, appearance of a bow tie. So if you draw, this is the uh, same image when you're looking at the meniscus from the top end. And if you draw a sagittal image going through the peripheral part of the meniscus, we can see the same structure here. So that's the anterior, that's the posterior, and we can see that the meniscus low signal intensity is shaped like a bow tie. As you move further towards the central side of the knee, you will see the bow tie shape still continuing. We've got a larger posterior horn and we've got a smaller anterior horn. That's the classical appearance of a normal medial meniscus. Going further towards the central side of the knee joint, now we've come across a place where the two segments of the bow tie appear to have been separated by the space present between the meniscus. If you do not get to see the bow tie on at least two consecutive slices, then you know that you are dealing with a possible meniscal tear that is the meniscal tissue has been significantly attenuated and there is a degenerative tear present. More about that later. A couple of uh, pitfalls which you need to be aware of. The anterior horn of lateral meniscus where it is attached to the tibia can normally show a lot of feathery appearance. That feathery appearance is because the tibial attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament shares an origin with this structure. And where these ligament fibers are interdigitating, then it can become this feathery appearance like that. I've seen that people who have started uh, reporting knee MRs, they tend to call this as a possible tear. A tear of the anterior horn of lateral meniscus can happen but when it happens, it almost always tends to communicate with the body of the lateral meniscus. So if you just see what looks like a tear of the anterior horn of lateral meniscus, I would undercall that and would not necessarily call it as a tear. The second um, normal variant that you need to be aware of or a pitfall of imaging, I should say, is the phenomena of meniscal flounce that's a normal finding, and you can tend to see it in both medial and the lateral menisci. And the meniscus just looks a little wavy in appearance and contour. So that's a normal finding. The third pitfall is the presence of a transverse ligament. So I'm going to just follow um, this patient's scan. We've got the meniscal tissue here. And as we go towards the central side, this is the anterior horn of the uh, meniscus. And we can see that there is a structure which tends to travel all the way up where it then connects with the anterior horn of lateral meniscus. So follow that again. This is the anterior horn of medial meniscus. We are traveling towards the lateral side, outer side. And we can see that there is this low signal intensity structure. And if you just look at the single image here, you can suspect that there is a tear of the anterior horn of medial meniscus. Uh, 
But if you follow it, you see that it actually gets communicated with the meniscus. And in the axial image, it is this structure which causes this confusion. And that's a normal anterior transverse ligament. It's not a tear. Laterally, we have got the attachment of the popliteus tendon. So the popliteus muscle arises from the back of the upper tibia, and then it travels posterolaterally to get attached to the popliteus groove present on the lateral femoral condyle. This is intimately related to the lateral collateral ligament and to the tendon of biceps femoris, where they are attached to the head of the fibula, the conjoint tendon. Peripherally, in the meniscal tissues, you've got the meniscocapsular area. So that's the medial meniscus. And we can see that it is quite intimately related to the medial collateral ligament. If there is a separation between the two, we know that that's not a normal phenomena. On the lateral side, you've got more of a normal space. There are meniscotibial and meniscofemoral struts of connective tissue which connect the body of lateral meniscus with the ipsilateral femoral and tibial condyles. Posterior horn of the lateral meniscus is intimately related to this low signal intensity structure, which is the popliteus tendon, which I identified earlier for you. Whereas on the medial side, we've got fibro fatty tissue at the back of the posterior horn of medial meniscus. So notice that the posterior horn of lateral meniscus is different from posterior horn of medial meniscus. Here we've got the popliteus tendon. Here we've just got some fibro fatty connective tissue. Another important factor which we need to remember is that the menisci, although they are fibrocartilage, they do have blood vessels in the peripheral one third of the meniscal tissue. Because of the presence of these blood vessels, the signal intensity in the outer one third of the meniscus can be a little greater. And that's a normal finding. The low signal intensity meniscus, whenever you see an increased signal intensity, the relatively inexperienced radiologists, they tend to begin to think about degenerative change or a possible meniscal tear. But remember, in the young patients in particular, you will come across some increased signal intensity in the meniscal tissue, which is because of normal vascularity. Now, clinically speaking, when you're talking about patients with meniscal tears, you've got patients who present with pain in the knee joint, symptoms of knee joint giving way, symptoms of locking of knee, clicking, when they walk or they move, and limping. They can or they may or may not be soft tissue swelling uh, in the knee joint. Posterior horn of either meniscus should never be smaller than the anterior horn. So in case of medial meniscus, we know that the posterior horn is larger. And in case of lateral meniscus, it is of equal size to the anterior horn. If the posterior horn of any meniscus is smaller than the anterior horn, then we've got a problem. That means that there is a tear. The criteria of uh, diagnosing a meniscal tear, you have to have a high signal intensity, which reaches the articular surface of the meniscus on at least two consecutive slices. This is the so-called two-slice touch rule, and its positive predictive value is almost 100%. So if you've got a clearly increased signal intensity present in the meniscus and it reaches a articular surface, then that is a very good indication that we're dealing with a tear. So normal meniscus is of low signal intensity. Once you've got a tear, it's of a bright signal intensity. And we've said that it has to reach an articular surface. And that would make it as a tear. You can have bright signal intensity, which does not touch the articular surface, either lower or upper. It is just contained within the meniscus. These are 
examples of medial meniscus, notice the large posterior horn and the fibular head, you can just about see it there. So that's the medial meniscus and it's got bright signal intensity. It's not low signal like the anterior horn is, but this bright signal does not reach the upper or the lower margins of the meniscus and that's a mucoid degeneration. The second criteria is that you end up with a meniscus which has an abnormal shape. It has lost its bow tie or it has got a missing segment of the meniscal tissue. The tears can be a of longitudinal variety or a horizontal cleavage variety. A horizontal tear would divide the meniscal tissue into an upper and a lower half, whereas a longitudinal tear will divide it longitudinally along the length of the meniscus, longitudinal axis of the meniscus. Here is an example of an undersurface oblique shaped tear. So you've got a coronal image and you've got a sagittal image. That's the medial meniscus again. You've got the iliotibial band attached on the lateral side. And we can see that there is a bright signal intensity which connects the inferior meniscal surface. And in the sagittal image, it also connects with the inferior meniscal surface. And you have to have that in at least two consecutive slices. And that's a good example of a horizontal cleavage tear. Notice that this tear, it divides the knee into an upper and a lower half. So that's the example of a horizontal cleavage tear. This type of tear, is more commonly seen in patients with degenerative knee joints. So patients of an elderly age group beyond 45, I would say. The same sort of horizontal cleavage tear can have a bit of a longitudinal component in it, in which case it will end up being called as an oblique shaped tear. So an oblique tear is, is not exactly horizontal like that, but it's showing an oblique configuration. So it's a mix of horizontal and a longitudinal uh, component of a tear. That's a left knee joint. So you've got the medial collateral ligament here. You've got the iliotibial band here. The medial meniscus shows this bright signal intensity going through the body of the medial meniscus. And in the sagittal imaging, it is present over the anterior horn and that's an oblique shape tear. A vertical tear is perpendicular to the tibial plateau. It goes along the longitudinal axis of the meniscus, parallel to the circumference of the meniscus. So instead of going in this direction, it's going in this direction. And a longitudinal tear is usually seen in patients who have got traumatic tears. So these are younger patients and they are physically active athletes, your football players, your basketball players who are otherwise healthy and fit and they end up with this uh, type of a tear. That's a nice example. This is an axial image, the same sort of image that we saw uh, at the start of my talk when we were trying to remember the mnemonic which describes the structure arrangement on the upper tibia. That's the front, that's the back. Um, that's the medial side, that's the lateral side. And the medial meniscus here shows this longitudinal configuration of a tear. So this by definition is present along the longitudinal uh, axis of the meniscus. And if you look at the coronal imaging, it has divided the meniscus not into an upper and a lower half, but into a medial and a lateral half. So that's the difference between a longitudinal tear and a horizontal tear. Similarly, in sagittal imaging, it is not dividing the meniscal tissue into an upper and a lower half, but into an anterior and a posterior half. So that tells you that we're dealing with a longitudinal tear. And this is the type of tear which, as I've said, tends to happen in younger, athletically active patients. Another point to note is that the longitudinal tear usually happens in the vascular segment of the meniscus. And what does that mean? Why is that important? It is important because that means that this type of a meniscus can heal relatively better because there's blood supply there. It will be able to repair itself with granulation tissue and there is some 
prognostic importance to try and uh, understand that these meniscal tears can be treated successfully. The third type of a tear is called a radial tear. A radial tear happens in the central free edge of the meniscus. It can result in articular surfaces getting in contact with each other because uh, the tear is happening at the area of the meniscus where uh, the bones are quite close to each other. It tends to result in cartilage damage at the adjacent surfaces and there is a degenerative change present in the knee joint. These tears are small in size, but they can be surprisingly uh, symptomatic. So um, important to see them, uh, these small uh, radial tears. If they're not recognized early enough with the continued uh, weight bearing and use, they can very quickly increase in size and then they cause a lot of problem. Imagine that you're looking at the top end of the tibial condyle and you can see the C-shaped meniscus here. And when you have a radial tear going like that and you did a sagittal imaging, then you will be able to see the anterior horn of the meniscus quite nicely. But where the posterior horn should have been, you won't see anything. So that's a ghost meniscus. And that means that there is a radial tear. So if you had a sagittal imaging here, that will be completely normal with anterior and posterior horns. A sagittal image here would have the bow tie, but right through the tear, you'll only get the front and not the back. If you have a tear going through the central part of the meniscus, then this on the coronal imaging will have the same sort of an appearance that you will have the peripheral segment of the meniscus indicated by this light blue color area. And then the central uh, darker area would be where the tear has happened. You won't see that. So the radial tear, depending on where exactly they are and how you are choosing to image them, they can look a bit different. If you did that in the sagittal plane, you will have the normal anterior horn, then you'll have the missing meniscal tissue, and then you'll have the normal posterior horn. So it, will, it should have been a bow tie here, but you've got the meniscal tissue only at the front and at the back, and here it's a missing meniscal tear. Uh, radial tears, of course, can happen in a slightly oblique fashion like that. And if you did that, you will see in this example, this is a lateral meniscus. We've got a tear here. And then in the sagittal imaging, instead of the bow tie, we can see a blunted anterior half of the meniscus with a tear here and the straight edged posterior half of the meniscal tissue. Here in this case, we can see in the coronal imaging, there is a tear here in the medial meniscus, but concentrate on the lateral meniscus. We can see that there is a central edge of the meniscal tissue, which is missing. And when you do a sagittal imaging here, we can see that there is a sharp uh, radial tear present right at the front, junction of the anterior horn and body of lateral meniscus. Depending on exactly where the meniscal uh, tear is, you can have what is called the marching cleft sign. So imagine a meniscal tissue with a oblique shaped radial tear. So if you did a sagittal imaging here, we will have this sort of an appearance, lots of normal meniscal tissue, and then the radial tear at the back. Then the next sagittal imaging, the cleft would have moved slightly more anterior. And the next sagittal image towards the central part of the knee joint, it would have moved still further. So because of the shape of the radial tear, consecutive sagittal images show that the cleft marches progressively forwards. And that's uh, not an unusual appearance when you're evaluating for a radial tear. And that's the marching cleft sign in um, actual uh, live case. We can see that the sagittal image here shows the cleft present here, then further back, and then further back. So that's a marching cleft sign for a radial tear. Uh, 
a few um, points to remember in terms of uh, identifying meniscal tears. Medial meniscal tears are more common than lateral. Lateral meniscus has got some sort of a protection because the popliteus tendon is attaching to it. So whenever the meniscal tissue is getting caught between the moving uh, lower femur and upper tibia, the popliteus can sort of pull it out of the harm's way and therefore the lateral meniscal tear is relatively less common. It does happen, but medial meniscus tends to tear more commonly because it's relatively more immobile. Up to 80% will have some sort of an associated ligamentous tear. These could be the meniscofemoral and meniscotibial ligaments or one of the cruciate or collateral ligament injuries. In cases of acute tear of anterior cruciate ligament, medial meniscus posterior on and the meniscocapsular area of the medial meniscus can be torn in up to 40 to 80% of cases. Whereas a lateral meniscus tear tends to uh, tear more commonly at the posterolateral corner. In cases of chronic anterior cruciate ligament insufficiency, patients who have had their ACL torn, but they have not chosen to get it repaired and are carrying on with an incompetent ACL, the incidence of a medial meniscal tear reaches almost 90% because the knee joint is very floppy. It's moving all the time, particularly when they're coming down the stairs. And therefore, the meniscal tissue tends to get caught more commonly between the femur and the tibia. When you have multi-ligamentous injuries, like injury to the anterior cruciate ligament and medial collateral ligament, because of the mechanism of injury, the pivot shift mechanism, the lateral meniscus tends to get affected more commonly despite the protection that is offered by the popliteus tendon. The radial tear distribution tends to happen more commonly on the, again, on the anterior horn of lateral meniscus, then posterior horn of medial meniscus tends to get affected most commonly. That's very important. Remember what I told you about the uh, degenerative horizontal shaped tears tends to divide the meniscus into an upper and a lower half. And it is these sorts of meniscal tears, which with the passage of time will end up with a parameniscal cyst. Connective tissue of the meniscus, which is degenerate, tends to keep on leaking out and you will end up with a parameniscal cyst. Why is it important to remember? Because sometimes almost all the times, it is much more easy to see the parameniscal cyst. That's like an indication which tells you that something is not right. And then you look carefully at the meniscal tissue and you find a tear. You cannot have a big parameniscal cyst without a clearly defined meniscal tear. So look carefully and you will find one. And that's what I mean. It's very easy to see um, a tear present in the body of lateral meniscus by the presence of this big parameniscal cyst. That's the lateral meniscus, that's the iliotibial band. And we can see the cleft here, but then the big parameniscal cyst tends to highlight the area of meniscal degeneration. The longitudinal tears and the oblique tears, they are usually repaired. They can be repaired. I won't say usually, because you have to see who the patient is in terms of elite athletes. This type of a tear at least has the potential of getting repaired because they're present in a young person. The tear is present in the vascular segment of the meniscus. And it is important for those people to carry on with as much meniscal tissue because of what they do. And therefore, they will be the candidates to have it repaired. The radial tear, the horizontal tear, and the complex shaped tears, they tend to get debridement or partial meniscectomies. The idea is to try and preserve as much meniscal tissue as you can. Because there's no doubt that once patients lose their menisci, then their knee joints would have an early degree of degeneration. <laughs>
What about this term that we keep on hearing, which is the bucket handle tear? A bucket handle tear is a type of a longitudinal tear which tends to get bigger. So vertical longitudinal tear, 10% of meniscal tears can be the bucket handles because they can eat up a huge amount of normal meniscal tissue. So you will end up with an absent bow tie sign. And once you have seen an absent bow tie, then you look carefully in the intercondylar notch or at the peripheral margins of the meniscus and you will see a displaced meniscal fragment either giving rise to a double cruciate ligament sign or a flipped meniscus sign. So longitudinal tear happens and with the passage of time, it just gets bigger. So here's the meniscus, then you got a longitudinal tear and then you've got the displaced meniscal tissue going towards the central segment and it can get curled up uh, and just becomes a loose body inside the knee joint with an attenuated rest of the meniscus. Here's an example, a coronal and a sagittal imaging of the right knee joint, that's the lateral side. We can see that the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus can be seen here. The medial meniscus is uh, quite attenuated. Compare the body size of the anterior horn of lateral meniscus with the body of medial meniscus. And there is some low signal intensity tissue present in the intercondylar notch. And when you do a sagittal imaging, we can see that there is a big low signal intensity structure present in the intercondylar notch, giving rise to a double PCL sign. And that's a displaced meniscal fragment, which has come from the body of the medial meniscus um, based on the pathophysiology, which I've explained schematically in those orange colored diagrams. If you have a uh, bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus, then you will end up with a double ACL sign. The horizontal or oblique meniscal degenerations or tears can be asymptomatic because they tend to happen in elderly patients. They have got some pains, but not too bad, uh, and they can carry on. The radial, the vertical, the complex or displaced meniscal tears are usually symptomatic and they would result in the clinical syndrome that we mentioned earlier in terms of painful locking, clicking knee joints. Um, of course, if the horizontal or oblique shaped meniscal tear is accompanied by injury to the collateral ligaments or pericapsule or soft tissues or bone marrow edema, then they would have symptoms more readily uh, with them. The displaced or a flap shape tear is the example of a tear when there is a meniscal tear present, which instead of traveling towards the intercondylar notch, it tends to flip underneath the meniscal body and can be present uh, below or above the meniscal tissue. And here are the examples. So you've got the uh, medial meniscus which has got a markedly attenuated posterior horn and a very chunky anterior horn. Um, I explained to you earlier that you can never have the situation in which the posterior horn of any meniscus is bigger, uh, is smaller than the anterior horn. So that clearly is not normal. And when you look carefully, you realize that there's actually not anterior horn by itself, but some of the meniscal tissue from here has flipped forwards and has resulted in this sort of double meniscal tissue present anteriorly, which you can see in the axial imaging here and in the coronal imaging there. So there's an abnormal meniscal tissue which is transferred from back to the front. It can be good exercise and good fun to try and uh, look for the displaced meniscal fragment. which usually happens in the intercondylar notch. So we've got the right uh, knee joint, lateral side is here, medial side is here. We can see that the body of medial meniscus is uh, showing increased signal intensity and it's smaller in size and there is this displaced meniscal tissue which is present in the intercondylar notch.
Um, another example of displaced meniscal fragment, this time present in front of the anterior cruciate ligament on this side. Another example of displaced meniscal tissue in the intercondylar notch, it just looks like a big uh, globular mass of fibrous tissue and notice the absent and attenuated medial meniscus. You can have injuries to the peripheral aspect of the meniscus. Um, I briefly touched upon this concept earlier. It is important for us radiologists to identify this injury because the arthroscopists will not see it. It's present on the peripheral side of the meniscus. It tends to happen in the red zone, the vascular segment of the meniscus, and therefore it has the potential to spontaneously heal or get a good surgical repair. If it's not treated, then the meniscus can end up being unstable will result in pain and locking and the meniscal will become what's called a floating meniscus. The meniscocapsular injuries in the medial meniscus, you should look carefully at the peripheral part of the meniscus, which in the sagittal imaging will be posteriorly and in the coronal imaging will be at the peripheral medial side of the meniscus. Notice that there's a bright signal intensity present here, which is almost the same as water signal, and it is separating the normal fibro fatty tissue, which is present here. In the coronal imaging, the tear is more easy to see. A bucket handle tear, we've seen example of this double PCL sign. and the flipped meniscus we've seen earlier. The displacement of the meniscal tissue can happen below the body of the meniscus, as we can see here, on both lateral and the medial sides. What about post-operative meniscus? We can have... Um, Whenever you are asked to comment upon a knee joint in a patient who has had a post-operative repair, then it is very important to try and dig the previous images. Unless you know what the meniscal tissue looked like in the preoperative scan, it is very difficult to see the new findings, how significant they are. People have tried doing uh, MR arthrography, uh, both direct and indirect. Direct arthrography means you inject gadolinium in the uh, knee joint space and then see the little clefts which get outlined by uh, gadolinium, which indicate the presence of a meniscal tear. Or you can use intravenous gadolinium and then image to see if there is any enhancing scar tissue present, granulation tissue in the meniscus. But unless you have the previous imaging, it is quite difficult to know the full significance of these. If you see a clear evidence of fluid bright signal intensity in a meniscus, which connects the meniscal tissue with the articular surface, that's a clear sign of a re-tear. If it was not present in the previous imaging and you see it here, then that's, that's abnormal. A recurrent meniscal tear sometimes can be difficult to see if the signal intensity is not bright enough on fat suppressed sequences because you cannot differentiate between scar tissue and a meniscal tear. And in these cases, after carefully comparing with the previous imaging, if the question is still there, then we have to revert to some sort of arthrographic examination. Okay, so that's all I had to say about menisci. I'll move on to the cruciate ligaments, which are also extremely important structures, particularly the anterior cruciate ligament. And in physically active patients, um, I would say 60% of the injuries involve the cruciate, uh, anterior cruciate ligament. You've got two of them. It's a tale of two structures, remember? The anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament.
the posterior cruciate ligament has got more of a bland, dark, ligamentous appearance to it, whereas anterior cruciate ligament has clearly two bundles, the anteromedial bundle and the posterolateral bundle. The anteromedial bundle looks like the PCL, but it's thinner in size, and the posterolateral bundle has more of fan-shaped appearance, which is uh, present posteriorly connects the anterior margin of the um, tibial eminence with the lateral femoral condyle and the posterior cruciate ligament connects the posterior margin of the upper tibial eminence with the medial femoral condyle. In the coronal imaging we can see the lateral side occupied by the ACL in the intercondylar notch and the medial side occupied by the more globular cylindrical posterior cruciate ligament. In the axial imaging again, we can see the anterior cruciate ligament towards the lateral side and the posterior cruciate ligament is more towards the medial femoral condylar side. I would encourage you all to look for these ligaments in all three planes. When you have a tear of these structures, in the acute phase, you will end up with a disruption of the ligament it's wavy or lax contour, having increased signal intensity and replacement of the ligament tissue with a soft tissue mass. So in terms of an anterior cruciate ligament tear, there is a waviness and a lack of uh, visualization of the ACL. We can't see any anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament has got a hook shaped configuration. If you look at the same structure in the coronal plane, we can see the medial uh, side occupied by an intact TCL, but the ACL is gone in the coronal plane. And similarly, in the axial plane, towards the lateral side, there is just some fluid signal intensity with a few floating ligament fibers uh, representing a torn ACL. The femoral attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament is the one which gets torn more commonly. And once it gets torn, you will notice that the ligament fibers tend to sag within the intercondylar notch. Instead of showing a normal taut appearance, it shows a more flappy and horizontal appearance. Again, see them in all three planes and you will notice that the ligament fiber injury can be identified in all three. Sometimes the radiographers have not aligned <clears throat> the sagittal imaging along the lateral femoral condyle, in which case the contour of the ligament fibers can be tricky and therefore it's good practice to train yourselves to recognize the cruciate ligaments in both uh, coronal and axial imaging, in addition to the sagittal imaging. Another example of a torn anterior cruciate ligament from the femoral attachment, there is some ligament fibers attached, but they are not normal. They show a uh, abnormal configuration of morphology. And in the coronal imaging, we've got a uh, complete tear. Sometimes, um, relatively uncommonly, you can get a tear of the anterior cruciate ligament from the tibial attachment site, and that's called the tibial avulsion of the ACL. It used to be a very common injury in the times when children still used to go out to play and would ride a bicycle. Um, I mean, a virtual, not a virtual bicycle, but a real bicycle. And it was said that if a child falls from a bicycle and ends up with a swelling of the knee joint, they have got tibial avulsion of ACL until proven otherwise. These days, kids, of course, don't go out to do those things anymore. They are all on their computers and they're getting their joystick thumbs or Nintendo thumbs as they're called. But the tibial avulsion of the ACL you can see a bone fragment, which has evolved from the tibial attachment site. And in the intercondylar notch, all we see is a big uh, mass of fibrous tissue. 
It's the partial interstitial tears of ACL, which tend to cause a lot of confusion. Um, it was thought at the time, at some time, that ACLs don't suffer from partial thickness tears. That clearly is not right, but it's not common. <clears throat> I have seen examples of patients who get a tear of the ACL and the ligament fibers, instead of showing the normal uh, fan-shaped configuration, it just becomes an amorphous and slightly edematous mass of ligament fibers. And if you look carefully, you will see associated signs like knee joint effusion. History is very typical. They have had some injury and they have got pain. So you can have a sprain of the ligament and then um, with time it will settle and the sprained ligament will end up showing some signs of uh, some type of scarring. When you get a tear of the ACL, you will end up with some secondary signs. The lateral condyle of tibia can travel more anteriorly. Um, I think it's more than five millimeters. It's about seven to 10 millimeters at least. Uh, if you compare it from the back end of the lateral femoral condyle. The posterior one third of lateral meniscus gets uncovered um, because of the anterior position of the uh, tibia. The posterior cruciate ligament will get buckled. You will get a characteristic bone bruising present on the lateral femoral condyle and the medial femoral and tibial condyles. You will end up with injury to the medial collateral ligament and a deep lateral femoral notch. All these are indirect secondary signs of ACL, but in patients in whom the clear evidence of a direct full thickness tear is not present, it's very useful to have uh, a knowledge of these uh, secondary signs. So this is what I meant by saying that there is uh, an anterior tibial draw. That's the lateral side of the tibiofemoral joint. That's the lateral tibial condyle. And if you draw a straight line from the back end of the lateral tibial condyle, and measure the distance of the line drawn from the back end of the lateral femoral condyle, if it's more than seven millimeters, um, that is significant. You will have the uh, uncovering of the lateral third of the um, posterior horn of lateral meniscus, which is posterior to the upper tibia. You will have a hook-shaped configuration of the posterior cruciate ligament. If you draw a line from the back end of the PCL and take it up, it just goes parallel to the posterior margin of the femur. Normally, this line goes like that. But in terms of ACL uh, tears, the PCL posterior line goes parallel to the back end of the uh, lower femur. The pivot shift injury happens when uh, the knee joint is rotated uh, with a, a valgus force. And when that happens, you end up with damage to the medial collateral ligament, which is completely gone. This is a right-sided knee. The force was coming from this side, and that results in the upper femur getting bent this way and lower tibia getting bent this way, which puts a greater degree of tensile force on the MCL, and it gets torn. with a tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. You get characteristic bone bruising, which is present on the lateral femoral and tibial condyles. And you get some uh, edema of the medial femoral condyle also. Another example of the full thickness rupture of ACL. Notice the bright signal intensity present and bone bruising on the lateral side of the tibiofemoral articulation. When the ACL tear is torn, you will get tears of the medial meniscus. You will end up with meniscocapsular contusions and tears of the posterior horn. You will get lateral compartment contusions and medial tibial contusions. Not everything related to the anterior cruciate ligament is because of uh, ACL tears. You will have um, 
situations in which there would be bright signal intensity within the anterior cruciate ligament. And this is in keeping with an anterior cruciate ligament ganglion cyst. And when you get these ganglion cysts, these are actually um, myxoid degeneration of the anterior cruciate ligament connect tissue fibers. And you end up with this bright signal intensity, which tends to splay the ligament fibers. <coughs> With the mucoid degeneration of anterior cruciate ligament, the ligament fibers become swollen. And this is called the drumstick appearance or the celery stick appearance. And that's a, um, it's not a tear, it's a mucoid degeneration of the ACL fibers. Normal alignment of the anterior cruciate ligament should be parallel to the uh, Blumen Satz line. This is a line which is the line drawn along the roof of the intercondylar notch. So normal satisfactory placement of anterior cruciate ligament uh, reconstructive fibers should be parallel to this line. When the ligament fibers are more vertical like that, so that's the Blumensatz line, and you can see that the reconstructed ACL fibers are more vertical then that means that the ligament is not going to be able to do its normal job of keeping the tibia in position. When coming down, it will carry on going back. So that's an incompetent uh, ligament. It's a badly positioned tibial tunnel. It's very important to try and assess these when you're looking for uh, effective repair of the anterior cruciate ligament and you will come across these patients very commonly it's a very common repair procedure done and we as radiologists are asked to comment upon the adequacy of the repair and what we need to do is to find the central sagittal image find the blumensatz line and then see the relationship of the tibial tunnel as compared to the blumensatz line in terms of complications of anterior cruciate ligament, the tibial tunnel can be too far back or too far anterior. If it's too far anterior, it will result in the impingement of the ligament fibers caused by its rubbing against the roof. And if it's too far back, then it will be incompetent because uh, the tibia will continue to come forwards. So normally it should be parallel like that. And if it's too far to the front, then the ligament fibers will rub against the intercondylar notch and the ligament fibers will disrupt and it will become an incompetent repair again. When you see that sort of a appearance, then all the secondary signs of ACL incompetence will become visible again. So you will have the anterior tibial draw and you'll have the hook-shaped PCL. We will have disruption of the ligament fibers with lack of visibility of the reconstructed ligament fibers in the intercondylar notch, both on sagittal and on coronal imaging. And you will end up with fibrosis present in the anterior aspect of the intercondylar notch, which is called the cyclops lesion. So there's normally, you will see at least some fibrosis. It's very common to see that anterior to the ligament fibers, but once this becomes hypertrophied, then that becomes symptomatic and the patients will have uh, a problem in terms of pain in the front of the knee joint. PCL injuries by comparison, are relatively less common and less important. Um, but once you see them, happens because of uh, injury to the front of the tibia. So like a dashboard injury, this force pushes the tibia back and that results in disruption of the PCL. When you see it, it's one of the most easy structures to recognize in uh, knee joint MR because it's very thick and very bland. And when you see it getting disrupted, you will see that quite easily it can result in a globular swelling of the um, ligament fibers. You can get um, mucoid degeneration with big meniscal, uh, sorry, uh, ligamentous ganglion cysts within it. 
and you can get disruption of the uh, ligament fibers from the femoral attachment and in the mid substance. The a femoral attachment of PCL happens less commonly, but it, it does happen. And when you have that, it's got a big bone fragment, which has disrupted from its femoral tibial attachment site. And thankfully, this has got a better prognosis because bone tends to heal better than the ligament itself. So the same patient, when you see example on MR, we can see fluid signal intensity separating the tibial attachment of PCL. Uh, with some surrounding bone marrow edema. Moving on to the collateral ligaments, um, we've got the medial and the lateral collateral ligaments. The medial collateral ligament is present uh, more anteriorly. The lateral collateral ligament anteriorly, lateral collateral ligament complex, I should say, anteriorly has an iliotibial band. And then further posteriorly, it has the lateral collateral ligament proper and the biceps femoris tendon which forms the conjoint tendon and attaches to the upper fibula. So the MCL is more to the anterior side and the lateral collateral ligaments are present more posteriorly. When you've got a grade one sprain then you will have edema present at the superficial aspect of the MCL when you have got a grade two sprain, you will have some disruption of the ligament fibers and edema present on both superficial and deep aspects. That's the coronal image of the right knee joint, fat suppressed sequence and non-fat suppressed sequence. We can see disruption of the fibers of MCL. There's a medial meniscal tear also present. And a grade three tear is when you've got a full thickness tear. This is the left knee joint we can see there's a full thickness disruption of the femoral attachment of the medial collateral ligament, lots of bone bruising and soft tissue edema. You can uh, have multiple ligaments getting injured. Of course, you will have this patient uh, showing examples of injury to the MCL, to the iliotibial band and to the lateral collateral ligament. So significant knee joint trauma.